Hello, I'm David Mandy, representing the pro bono arm of O&M Partners here in New York. COVID-19 has disrupted all of our routines. Um, O&M has partnered with Feldman Physical Therapy and Performance to help you get the right workout routine going at home. Feldman Physical Therapy um, is run by Justin Feldman, who received his doctorate in physical therapy from Ithaca College in 2007. After practicing for five years, uh, Justin opened his own practice. He uh, has a long list of qualifications, a very interdisciplinary. He's a Titleist Performance Institute certified. He's a functional strength coach and certified. He's certified as a speed and agility coach, a weightlifting performance coach, as well as an Ironman coach. He serves as an advisor to the Marist College rowing team, teaches a weekly mobility class at Locomotive CrossFit in Beacon, New York. Uh, in 2017, the Dutchess County Regional Chamber of Commerce awarded Justin as an honoree for the 40 and under group. He was the past president of the, and the treasurer of the Hudson River Rowing Association and is the current vice president of the Mid-Hudson Roadrunners Club. Before we turn to Justin, I'd like to turn the call over to my colleague, Jennifer Rankin, who um, had this idea and has really helped um, get it off the ground. So I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Okay, thank you very much, David. Um, I am the Director of Engagement and Development here at O&M Partners. And um, at O&M, we pride ourselves on bringing our viewers great stories and great ideas. And this is not only a great story, a great company, but it's a great local business here in the Hudson Valley. I first met Justin uh, when I joined the uh, a local running group. It was a half marathon training group uh, run by Fleet Feet Poughkeepsie. And what I can say is the ideas and suggestions that Justin is about to give you do work. I am living proof that they do work. I ran my first half marathon when I turned 40. And in the two years since that time, I have completed six, um, sorry, seven half marathons, two 25Ks, a full marathon, and an ultra marathon. And, um, you know, in my lifetime, I have had some injuries that, and I was told that I shouldn't probably be a runner, but I found that not to be true. I actually had uh, compartment syndrome surgery in my um, right leg when I was younger and almost had to have my leg amputated at the knee. And then in my left leg, um, I had a tear in my meniscus, which now has been much better because of um, running and just remaining active. And so, I really look forward to this presentation and thank you very much, Justin. All right, well, I want to, you know, thank everybody for joining us. It's, uh, you know, really an honor to be able to present to everybody. And so um, we're gonna get into everything here. And what we're gonna talk about is, we're gonna talk about wellness that you can control. and. Uh, health and wellness that you can have and utilize for a lifetime. And I think, you know, especially now there's so much going on that we can't control. Um, focusing on something that we can control is good and it also gives everyone a good satisfaction. And I think we need to start off with figuring out your why. Um, and so this right here, this is uh, the view from the top of Mount Snow in Vermont, uh, overlooking sort of Somerset Reservoir. And I spend my weekends all winter up there. Um, I volunteer on the ski patrol, taking the, the broken people down the mountain. And one of the um, you know most amazing things that happens to me every weekend is that uh, my kids are six and two, and they get to uh, ski with my dad, who's in his mid to late 60s. And it is uh, sort of a goal of mine to make sure that I'm able to do that same thing with my grandkids. And so when I look at sort of wellness and everything, that's sort of my my why and what I what I always sort of push towards. Um, so we talk about you know health and what really makes up your health and what is it comprised of. And I think you know this is a different for different people, but I think it's important that we sort of look at things um, in a little bit of a hierarchical thing. And you'll notice I put on the very bottom here lab values and data, and that's down there on the bottom for a reason. And so. If you look at how you feel, okay, I think this is one of the most important things because it really dictates the most. And so your lab values can be amazing, but if you don't feel good, you're not motivated, you don't feel like getting out of bed in the morning, you don't want to do anything, 
it doesn't matter if your cholesterol is in a good spot and your blood pressure is good. Okay, how you feel is really important. Um, same with what you can do, right? You want to be able to do certain things. And if the lab values say you should be totally good at doing these things and then you can't do them, we don't really care what the lab values and the data say. Um, resilience is another really, really big one. And resilience looks into basically how your body responds to stress and things happening. So if you're exposed to a cold, how well do you fight that off? If you get injured, how well or how fast do you heal? Those sort of things. That's what we look at when we talk about resilience. And then adaptability is another really, really important thing to think about. And I like to use ankle sprains as a model for adaptability. And so if there are two people who step off the same sidewalk and they misstep and one person severely sprains their ankle and tears a bunch of ligaments and another person sort of steps funny and then just continues on walking and crosses the street, that second person is way more adaptable. Um, and that comes from strength. It comes from using your body on a regular basis so it knows how to respond to these different things. Um, and that is really, really important, especially when we talk about preventing injuries, which is a big, a big deal. Um, I do wanna talk a little bit about how we sort of traditionally handle healthcare. And so I love this picture of this dog because I think it really, really shows sort of how we traditionally are doing things. And what happens here, right, is if we look at this, the traditional way that we handle healthcare is we will chase things. And so it's sort of like this dog chasing a squirrel, right? The dog is gonna just see the squirrel bounce after the squirrel, okay? And it reacts, right? You're gonna look for signs of an issue. The dog's gonna sort of look for the squirrel and it's gonna dart off in that other direction where the squirrel is. Um, you're gonna treat the issue as it comes up and then you sort of like wait for the next problem, okay? And that's sort of, you know, dog chases a squirrel, squirrel runs up the tree, dog lays down, waits for the next squirrel to come down. Um, I wanna sort of look at things and what we work with our patients on looking at things is, we sort of look at things the way Wayne Gretzky always sort of looked at, at hockey, right? And so a good player is gonna to play to where the puck is and a great player is gonna to go to where it's gonna be. And that's what we wanna get people to do is we wanna get our patients and clients and everybody sort of aware of this idea that when it comes to your own health and wellness, you don't have to wait for a problem. You can take action now um, and have a much larger impact. And so if that's the way we used to do things, what should we do? So I already sort of talked about my love of skiing and the more extreme, the better, right? And so I like to look at what we should do the way skiers approach skiing in the backcountry and dealing with avalanches and those sort of things, okay? Um, you're not gonna wait for there to be a problem, right? If there's gonna be an avalanche, if you wait for the avalanche, you're too late. Um, you're gonna control whatever variables you can control. Um, and so you're gonna make sure that you are skiing with the right people, that you have the right equipment, you're gonna do the right things, but you're gonna also monitor whatever you can't control. So you're gonna monitor the weather and you're gonna monitor the snow conditions. And that's what we wanna get people to be doing with their health is whatever you can't control, we wanna make sure you're monitoring it, but whatever you can control, we want to make sure that you as an individual are taking an active role in this and making sure that you're monitoring it. And so big thing that comes up, you know, things you can't control, genetics. Um, I've had a lot of patients who would really wish that they could, you know, pick their parents, um, but that doesn't work out so well. And so um, we can't control that. So we just want to monitor it. The more you know about your health history, your family history, the more powerful that can be. But what can you control? And this is where we wanna have a big impact and spend some time talking about today. So you can control, right, your diet. You can have a big control on your diet. You can have a big control on your sleep, exercise. And for the most part, you can have a pretty good control of your environment. And these are the things we wanna focus on because these are the things that you can control. And so we look at all these things, right? You could spend a lot of time diving into the internet about different recommendations for diets and some people are going to eat all carbs some people are going to eat no carbs high fat and i think the biggest benefit and the way to get the most out of it is to keep it as simple as you can be and so we work with everybody on trying to make sure that throughout the course of a week you're getting one serving of eight different fruits and vegetables per week and if you sit down and map that out it is not necessarily easy to do um, but as you sort of vary those fruits and vegetables you're gonna get a lot of vitamins and minerals. You're gonna eat a lot of nutritious meals. You're also not gonna have a lot of an appetite for snacks and some of those foods you shouldn't be having. 
because you're going to be filled up getting in all those things. Um, try and drink half your body weight in ounces of water per day. All right. Um, so, you know, if you weigh 200 pounds, you're looking for 100 ounces of water a day. Okay. Um, measure it, track it. Water bottles are great for that. Um, they got all the lines on the side. You know what you're taking in. And then the more colors you can eat at each meal, the better off you're going to be doing at the um, different fruits and vegetables. It's also an easy thing to track. You sit down to eat, look at your plate. There should be a lot of color there. If there's not a lot of color there, then you know you need to change something up about what you're doing. And so that's a really simple way of looking at diet that can be incredibly effective. Next thing we start to talk about is sleep. And sleep is one of these things where I think it's getting a lot, a lot of more attention now, but for a while it didn't. Um, if you dive down the rabbit hole of sleep, um, you need eight hours of sleep is what the average person needs per night. And sleep is one of these things that is annoying because you can go into a sleep deficit, but you can never bank sleep, right? So if you only get six hours one night and you get 10 hours the next night, you can't be making up for these things. Um, so you can really hurt yourself by going into sleep debt. Um, and there's no way to sleep extra and get it back. So you got to do your best to get your eight hours a night. Um, the information about what happens if you don't get it is scary. All right. So um, if you're not getting eight hours of sleep at night, you're increased for accidents, both in your car, but also just at work, like workplace accidents, your risk of workplace accidents goes through the roof if you're not getting eight hours of sleep. Um, and, you know, some of their corporate clients we work with, sometimes we start talking about this and you look at warehouses, different things where they want to try and cut down on accidents. Making sure people are getting eight hours of sleep is a huge way to do it. Heart disease, diabetes, weight gain, your risk of all of these things goes through the roof if you're not getting eight hours of sleep at night. And sleep also used to sort of be one of these things where people kind of took pride in saying like, I only need five hours of sleep. Um, it's not true. Everybody needs this eight hour number. Um, and if you're not getting it, you're all getting the same negative effect. You might not feel it the same, but you're having that negative effect. Um, your immunity gets significantly weaker if you're not getting eight hours of sleep at night. People who are talking about, you know, trying to stay healthy, strong immunity, and there's, you know, a million and one supplements and Instagram ads and things on the internet. And really the most powerful one that you can do is eight hours of sleep a night, um, as well as that drinking water thing. Um, that makes a huge difference. And then decreased life expectancy. Um, no one likes to see decreased life expectancy. Um, but if you're not getting that eight hours of sleep at night, there's a lot of uh, big risk for that decreased life expectancy. Um, now, exercise. So this is where, uh, you know, we really consider this our area of expertise in our practice. Um, but if you're not doing the other things, you can't sort of exercise your way out of the hole. Um, so I always sort of tell people, you know, you can never out-exercise your diet. And you can never out exercise bad sleep. Um, exercise, right? You're looking for one or the other here, right? Either 150 minutes of moderate intensity exercise or 75 minutes of vigorous intensity. And you're looking for that over the course of a week. And this is, there's a whole bunch of studies in these. Basically, the moderate intensity exercise, if you're not doing a heart rate monitor and all the technology, the best thing is you should be able to carry on a conversation while you're doing it. Vigorous intensity, you get a word out and then you kind of need to huff and puff and take a breath. And so what we're really looking for is a balance of the two. I want people to be getting a little bit of each. There's uh, different benefits, different cardiac functions of spending time in each zone. And we like people to have a little bit of a balance here because it really, really helps for long-term habit forming and really sticking to the plan of the exercise. There, there are myths about exercise, and, and I think these are things that are important to sort of dispel. Um, the first myth that I hear all the time is that, you know, it needs to be really, really hard, right? You feel like you need to be going, you know, crazy, get done, can't move, those sort of things. Definitely not true. You saw there, we need that moderate intensity exercise. Um, I'm going to show everybody later a little bit of a plan, elite level marathon runner. Um, one of the things you'll see sticking out there is the amount of times they go for a walk and that that counts as exercise. Um, people say they have an active job, okay? Um, thing with an active job is if you do it all the time, your body gets efficient at doing it, 
And then all of a sudden you're not really getting that exercise benefit. And so you still need to be exercising even if you have that active job, all right? The other thing we see is people say, well, I went to the gym this morning um, and so I'm good. And the problem is, you know, 60 minutes in the morning or in the evening, wherever you kind of fit it in, can't make up for what you're doing the other 23 hours a day. And so if we look at this, right, um, if you wake up, go to the gym, work out for an hour, and then you get in your car and you drive to work, and then you get to work and you sit at your desk, and then you get up, maybe grab some lunch, then you sit back at your desk, and then you get back in your car, and you sit down in your car, and you drive home, and you sit down for dinner, and then you get up and you sit down on the couch and watch TV, right? That 60 minutes can't make up for the rest of the day that you were basically sedentary. We need to build some more things into your day where you're up and moving around, whether it's going for a walk at lunch, whether it's making sure you're standing up and walking around the office while you're on the phone, whether it's finding little bursts of time during the day to do a couple push-ups, a couple squats, a couple of movements, something to break up that constant sedentary nature that we tend to fall into throughout the day. The other myth we hear is that sort of the ship has sailed on that. I'm too old for that. It's too late for me to start. Um, and that is never the case. It is never too late uh, to start exercising. Um, and uh, you can start getting the benefits right away. So no, don't let anybody tell you it's too late. Um, now we get into a little bit of, you know, unfortunate current events, but really, you know, why should we really care? And this sort of drives the point home. We look at some of the current things going on now with this current COVID crisis, but you look at over a period of time, only 6% of the patients who were diagnosed with COVID-19 in the New York hospital system did not have some other chronic condition. So we look at these chronic conditions, obesity, diabetes, hypertension, right? And we've heard this the whole time about the high risk categories and the other things, but one of the things is a lot of the initial high risk categories did not include obesity. We start to add obesity in there and it's amazing how we almost encompass a lot of these people. And you look at it, right? So that's 94% of the people that had it um, had these other conditions. And the problem with these conditions and what sort of like drives me a little crazy about this is that these are all preventable things. Um, they're easy to detect early on and they're very easy to manage and have a great effect on if we know they're there, we're looking out for them and we're going after it. They're also all things that if we were monitoring our lifestyle and different aspects ahead of time, we would know right away that they were a problem before they were even a problem and we could take action on it right away. Um, right now, um, we are all in an amazing spot. Um, the amount of technology available to us really puts us in the driver's seat as patients and clients and sort of consumers in the healthcare industry to take control of what's going on. Um, we have so many different devices and the ability to track so many different things. Um, I mean, it could be, you know, embarrassing. Like, I mean, my Apple watch on my wrist can do an ECG. Uh, my ring on my finger can measure my body temperature. Um, this other band on my other wrist can track all of my movement throughout the day. It can track my sleep cycles. It can track, track breathing rates. It can track all sorts of things. And it all goes onto an app on my phone where I can track all of these things all the time. And I can know more about my health data than I think you know, doctors could figure out in hours in the past and track it all the time. And it allows us to decrease the involvement of the medical community because we have a really good sense of what's going on within us. Um, some of these health benchmarks that we want to be tracking daily, right? If you don't have 14 different devices that you're going to be wearing, um, sleep, all right? So eight hours of sleep, we're going to keep pounding this home as we go through it. It is so important. And yeah, there are all sorts of fancy devices to track sleep. They're amazing. However, um, everyone's got a clock in their bedroom mostly. And so if you only spent six hours in bed, I know you didn't sleep for eight hours. So that's an easy one, right? Make sure you're spending at least those eight hours in bed going to sleep, um, preferably a little bit longer because we're not gonna sleep the entire time we're there. Um, resting heart rate changes. So yes, you can have devices that are gonna measure your resting heart rate. Technically, this should be during the period of time kind of right before you're waking up from the sleep, but you can check your pulse right when you wake up and have a pretty good estimate. The big thing we're looking at here is that it's steady and stable over time. and if this changes or we see a drastic increase in it, it 
it's a sign we're not sleeping enough. It's a sign that we might be starting to fight something off, whether it's a you know cold, something like that. Um, it's a sign there's something going on in our body harder than it should be, and it's not recovering the way it should be at night. And this means we might need to alter our activity going forward. And you'd be amazed how many times you might, I might sort of look at this thing and see, yeah, I don't know, that resting heart rate's creeping up, it's creeping up, it's creeping up. Sure enough, two or three days later, I get a cold. Um, and so if I knew that, maybe I get a little bit of extra sleep, a couple of nights, you might be able to help your body out. Body temperature is a big one. Um, this is obviously in the news all over the place now. Um, however, it's more of a big thing knowing your body temperature during certain times of day and where you are. Um, and a lot of times your body temperature is going to be at some of its lowest when you're waking up in the morning and as you're getting ready to go to bed at night. And one of the things I like to do is if I'm going to bed at night and my body temperature is elevated, it means I didn't do a good job calming down before I went into bed. And so instead of laying in bed and tossing and turning all over the place, I might hang out, read a book for a little bit, and then go to bed. And you're going to be much more effective at falling asleep that way. The last one, this is one of my favorites, getting up off the floor. And so there's all these studies that people with dogs live longer. And I love my dog. And so I love a study that verifies anything that I already think I'm right about. So, um, But one of the big things is having a dog makes you get up off the floor a lot. And getting up off the floor is tied to your lifespan and longevity. And so there's actually a lot of research on this. And this is something that, you know, if you take one thing away from this, I want to see people doing this, and testing this on themselves and knowing where they stand on this scale. So the way this works is what you're going to do is you're going to get up in the morning and any time of day, you know, whenever I like to do it in the morning, it's sort of if you keep a steady time, it, it helps the accuracy of it. And so what you're going to do is you get a scale of one to 10. You start with 10. All right. You sit on the floor. For every time that you need a hand, a knee, um, a elbow, any sort of extra support to get up, you deduct a point and you sit back down. Same thing. Anytime you need to touch anything to come back down, you deduct a point there. All right. The closer you stay to 10, the better, right? If you don't deduct any points. For each point higher on that scale that you keep, all right, you have a 21% improvement in your survival rating over a little bit more than six years, all right? Most of these studies are done on people between the ages of 51 and 80. And these, this test is actually used in some places to be able to figure out different types of treatment as far as um, different cancer treatments, different things, you know, based on how long do we think this person has, what's the right course of treatment to do. Um, and so in some countries, they do use that this this for that but for you if you go down and you're like man i should be able to do this and i can't do it it's a good sign that you need to practice that you need to get up and down off the floor more and if you ever just try and set a timer get up on down off the floor for two minutes it is a really good workout and it is hard now where do we want to see people going and sort of where have we taken things in our practice and, and what i want everybody sort of on this call today to sort of leave and do because we're really passionate about this. And the more people I can teach to do this, the more people they tell about that, the more this spreads and the better off we are. I want you to be in control of what's going on. Um, and that's really where the new healthcare model needs to go is to give you control of everything you can control and minimize that involvement of the healthcare model. Because the more control you have, the more compliant you are with it and the more you do it. Everybody knows you like things that you can control. Right. And so that's where we really, really want to push things. Um, and so there's sort of two different types of treatment that fit into this from the healthcare side. There's this synchronous side where we want you to have a semi annual visit to some medical professional. Right. I'm biased. I think that professional should be a physical therapist because I'm a physical therapist. And so if I didn't think that, then I'd be doing a big disservice to my profession. Um, but we are really, really well suited for this because we have a lot of time with our patients. Um, and that makes a huge difference when it comes to this. Um, we want it to be a wellness visit. I don't want you to have to go see this person because there's a problem, okay? I love when we see our wellness patients coming in every couple of months because everything's going great. And it's, it's a lot of fun. It's fun to catch up, it's fun to talk. It's a good, fun visit. And that's where we wanna keep things. These people should be able to meet you wherever you are. 
um, and we give these presentations not only to you know the general public, but but I'm trying to go out there and give them to people in the healthcare profession as well to get everybody moving. And so what we are doing here is right. We want them to be able to meet you in person, whether it's um, digitally, um, whether it's through text, email communication, right? We want you to be able to meet with them and have regular communication as things go. Then we sort of go into this asynchronous side of it. And this is where it's really important, right? It's a plan that's guided by that professional, okay? But you're gonna perform it on your own, right? But I want the professional to be able to monitor your progress remotely and you to be able to be held accountable. And this is where, if anybody's ever sort of gone to PT before and done this, right? Um, the traditional PT model is you're gonna see someone two to three times a week and you're gonna go home and right, you're gonna say, all right, they told me to do these exercises, but I'll see them in two days, I'll just do them then. And all of a sudden, right, that's only that synchronous side. You're not doing anything on your own there. And so what we do is we're, we tell our patients, no, we're not letting you come back in this week. We might not even let you come back in next week, okay? I want you to be doing this on your own at home we have a lot of software that we use that can help us monitor what our patients are doing in between. We have a lot of great communication portals that they can be doing, but what we've done is sort of flip this over. And so it's not on us to get our patients better and healthier and stronger. It's on them. We're gonna give them the tools, but it's on them to then go ahead and do it. And that's really, really important. So we look, right? And so these are just a couple of pictures to sort of show the synchronous side of things where we're gonna work with you. We're gonna make sure you know what to be doing, okay? And we're gonna make sure you know how to do it. But that asynchronous part is really, really important. And we sort of look here and right, so we've got a high level rower that we work with. She's in the clinic. We show her how to do things. We take videos of her doing these exercises, okay? So she leaves with an app on her phone. She knows what she should be doing, okay? She's got video of us giving her instructions and teaching her how to do it that she can watch whenever, but then also that communication portal's two-way, she could send me a video of her rowing, okay? And say, hey, that exercise is doing great, right? Or look, when I'm at this part of the rowing stroke, my shoulder's still killing me. Can we change that exercise? You know, what can we do? Um, and how do we go about moving those things along? And you can sort of see on the other side of the screen there, we like to use these types of uh, software to track the rest of people's home exercises and what they should be doing from a general strength training standpoint. And what happens in here is when you do something, you click it, I know. Um, I get a report at the end of every day, who did what? And it's easy for me as a provider to check in on people and see how they're doing. And I see, oop, you know, Sarah, she didn't do her thing. She wasn't supposed to be doing it. Bam, I quickly send Sarah a message at night and get her back on track the next morning. But it's all that asynchronous side where we're not doing it at the same time together and it's putting the patient in the driver's seat to be able to control their own wellness. And, you know, we've been doing a lot, obviously, now with all this COVID stuff via telehealth, but it is an amazing tool to be able to connect with people remotely, wherever they are, be able to see the inside of their house, of their workspace, what's going on, and to be able to make sure we're using that with what we're doing. And I think this is something you're going to see stick around the healthcare model. I don't even think, I know for a really, really long time. And you're gonna see a lot of transition over to this, uh, even as we start to come out on the other side of this current situation. So big takeaway here, right? How can you work to create your wellness plan and what should you be doing? The big thing is you wanna make sure that what you're doing is made for you specifically, right? You could go on the internet and you could download any number of strength training routines, running plans, all these things, right? But we don't want this cookie cutter approach because we're all different. We all have different goals. We all have different needs. That why that we talked about in the beginning is different for all of us. And we really, really want to make sure that what you're doing is for you. Okay. Um, obviously, you know, I love to be that person to create this plan. There's lots of different people out there that can do it, but you just want to make sure what you're getting is for you specifically. And that communication is key. Okay. There should be a continuous line of two-way communication back and forth. Doesn't need to be instantaneous. It doesn't need to be that I'm going to call them on the phone and talk to them, but the ability to send and receive messages, how's this feeling, what's going on, that is really important for your long-term compliance to the plan. We want this plan to be dynamic, okay? Uh, 
everything makes the most amount of gains if you're doing it and it is changing and growing with you as you're doing it, okay? Um, you will see diminishing returns if you do the same thing every day, all the time. Um, I always think back to my like high school economics teacher who said, you know, one Oreo is great, but every Oreo in the package that you eat after that, there's a diminishing return on how good that Oreo is. When you get to that last Oreo, you're not feeling so great about yourself. And, you know, that is the way exercise works. It's all the same, right? If you go and do the same thing in the gym every day, day in and day out, you are going to get less and less out of that. Um, we want this plan to be something that is lifelong for you, that can adapt and change with what you're doing so that you can really make sure you're hitting those goals. And this is sort of where I want to sort of kind of show everybody, right? So if we look at this plan, I think everyone could see it, right? This is a pretty high level marathon runner. You're going to see they're running at different paces, at different tempos. There's a ton of walks in here, okay? Um, that low intensity thing is key. Um, and you're going to see, right, that that top week, right, not a lot of stuff plugged into the calendar up there. There were some life events that popped up, and we had to sort of alter the plan. But then we were able to also bring things back down here so we can get back to that goal. And the next thing I like to sort of show the other side of the spectrum, this is a plan we wrote for a 68-year-old guy who had had back pain for a really, really long time just kind of figured it was something he had to live with and deal with. And then one day got sick and tired of it and we started working together and um, he's doing specific movements every day, but we're able to track what he's doing, know where he's going. And they're not easy. They're not what you would call rehabby exercises. He's doing tough stuff and that's what it takes in order to get better. And so big takeaway, right? What should you be doing tomorrow or tonight when you get out of here? Um, we're going to keep pounding this, go to sleep. All right. Um, get that eight hours, go to sleep. That's, I like to call it an easy one. I have a six-year-old and a two-year-old. I can tell you it is not easy at all. Um, but it's that one where you could say like, I don't need any equipment. I just, I got to go to sleep. Um, write down your goals. Okay. Um, write down what you're looking to achieve, what, what it is, what you want. And, and that makes a big difference. Um, Pick one piece of data. You go home today, pick one thing to track. Um, even if it's that sleep, or if it's, I'm gonna drink half my body weight in ounces of water. Start small, pick that one thing that you're gonna track, and then track it. And then don't pick a second thing until you're really successful at tracking the first thing. And then determine your why, figure out what it is, okay? What is it that, you know, top of that ski hill, what's your why, and determine that so that because everyone's going to kind of veer off course a little bit here. And what we want is, if you know what that is, then that's going to make a big difference. And then, you know, get up off the floor, try that, go home, try it out, make family, friends, try it. That's a good, uh, it's called a good party trick. No one's allowed to go to parties anymore. So, um, you know, bring, use it with your family and try that and sort of see, see how everybody does. Um, but that's a good one that you can do and, and use as an exercise right now. Um, and so that is what I have here for everybody. And now we're going to take some questions and, and go through whatever anybody wants to know. Thank you, Justin. Um, you're very wise. Um, I'm 61, so I'm more in the category of your father. Um, <laughs> lifelong, a lifelong skier. My son is 12, so I'm an older father. And of course, my goal is to ski with him till I'm 90. But I had, it almost didn't happen. Um, it's funny, I, I just want to represent six, you know, my age group. And what happens is they get a physical injury and then you know, they don't ever seem to come back. And as you say, there's, it's never too late. I mean, I had a perfect storm of things happen to me, having you know, gotten well into my 50s, still skiing bumps. Then I um, was in New York, uh, very sedentary, a lot of work, put on weight, didn't realize I had sleep apnea. When you get sleep apnea, of course, you have a hormone deficiency, so you eat more to make up for it. That was a good year, probably, of no, not a good night's sleep. Finally got that diagnosed, but still had a, weight, a lot of weight on me, and someone was talking to me about getting a knee replacement, a doctor. And then, the big, of course, you could probably guess what I did and solved all the problems. I lost weight. I lost 30 pounds. Mm -hmm. And everything, everything, all of my levels, I mean, 
right to my, it was incredible. And now I can beat him down the hill. That's not going to last for long, but. <laughs> but anyway, just the interconnectedness of it, all of it, and how, you know, you can get weighted against you as you get older. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Was, I'm afraid that was one of those people that asked, make more of a statement than uh, ask a question, but I would love your comments on that. Yeah, no, it's definitely something you, you know, you see a lot of that. Um, it's, it's easy to, it's easy for these things to spiral a little bit um, where one little thing kind of turns into another little thing, turns into another little thing. And sleep apnea is one of these things where, um, it, you know, it falls under that category that is, if you know you're looking for it, it can be, you know, it can be easy to pick up, but you don't get a good night's sleep, your body, your, you know, you talk about that hormone, your cortisol levels go up. Um, that also makes you more stressed. And then it also has this effect of making you crave sweet, salty, fatty, sugary foods. And then you start to gain weight, which everybody knows is not great for sleep apnea. And now you're in this spiral and then you don't feel good. So now you're not going to exercise as much. You end up gaining more on the weight side, the joints hurt. Um, it is definitely something where it goes, but you know, like what you said and what you did is a way to do it. You lose a little bit of that weight and all of a sudden these things start to fall into line. And as easy as things can spiral one way, they can spiral back the other way. Exactly it. And that's the, that's the positive. Um, so we're going to turn the call over to questions from the group. Um, I'll just help make sure we go from uh, Scott. Um, uh, we'll turn it over to you for that. And, um, go yeah. from there. I actually have a quick question. Your, your point about sleep was really well taken. And my question was, uh, does a regular sleep schedule matter as much? In other words, the same time each night? Um, yes. Yeah. So um, your body will want to function in rhythms. And if you try to force it out of that rhythm, and there are, um, you know, some people are, you know, the, the night owl or the early bird, right? So um, I fall into that early bird category where, I like to get up at a quarter to five, five o'clock in the morning, and I want to be in bed sleeping by nine. Um, and I can do that. That works great for me. My wife sort of falls into the night owl category where if she were to go into bed at nine, she's not going to sleep. It's not, just not going to happen for her. Um, the importance of that eight hours, if you're not sticking to the regular rhythm, it's much harder to get the eight hours. And your body wants to be in its own natural rhythm. Um, and that's where people tend to run into trouble or say, I can never get eight hours of sleep or I can't sleep at night is when you start to force yourself out of your natural rhythm. Got it. Well, thank you. I did want to mention too, uh, we have people on the attendee side. If you would like to ask a question, we'd love to hear from you. You can put up your hand by using the icon, raise your hand, and we will unmute you and you can ask uh, Justin a question. So we look forward to that. And I guess in the meantime, um, on the panelist side, I'm going to unmute everybody. And if you have a question, please just go ahead and um, and ask Justin. Um, I had a question. Um, this is Ali Ferguson here. I uh, so you mentioned um, the max heart rate, which um, I've heard of before, the 220 minus your age. What mm -hmm. happens when you go over that max heart rate? I get, um, you know, fairly close to it when I'm working out a lot of the time. Uh, and I've always been kind of nervous, but I'm not really sure what happens when, when I actually exceed it. So the 220 minus your age is a very rough sort of easy calculation. Um, to do it more accurately, there's all these other things that you add and subtract. And so if you exercise regularly, your max is probably 10 to 20 beats higher than that 220 minus your age formula. Um, and so I, like, I know for me, I do a lot of marathons, triathlons, like 220 minus my age almost gives me like 80% of my max heart rate. Um, if you're getting there, it's a safe place to be. Um, as long as you're regularly exercising and you're not doing anything crazy, it's totally fine. Um, the, the other side of it is, uh, you want to make sure that whatever you're using from the equipment side of it is accurate and that that's actually what your, you know, what your real heart rate is. Um, a lot of the ones that measure from your wrist with a watch, like the Apple watch sort of things, 
they're off by a little bit. So you it might read higher than it really is. But if you're getting there, it's a safe place to be. Great, thank you so much. I have a question. Since you talked briefly about getting up and down off the floor, that gets to be a little more important as you get older, and I'm the older part, although I don't want to yep. admit it. And is that something you can improve? It is something you can improve. And um, the getting up and down off your floor, off the floor, gets more important the you know the older you get. And the reason is that um, the the survival rate of people who, as you get older, if you have an injury as a result of a fall that requires a hospital visit, um, there's there's all these other you know things that tend to happen and you sort of end up in that spiral again. Um, and the more you get up and down off the floor, the better you are at falling. And so people who regularly get up and down off the floor, if they do fall and lose their balance, instead of their brain sort of saying, oh my God, what's gonna happen now? Their brain basically says, oh, this is the same as that thing we did on Tuesday morning. And you will gently go to the floor and be significantly less likely to get injured. And so the more you do it, the better at it you get. And if you do that little, you know, zero to 10 score, um, you'll see your score change as you practice it. Yeah, will it ever improve? Oh, yeah. Yep, it will. It will. Okay. Solve the other big argument for me. This 100 ounces of water. Um, I maintain yep. coffee and tea count, but other people don't agree with me. So uh, technically, from the medical community, coffee and tea do count. Um, they, they do count. What I always tell people to do is, uh, if you're drinking coffee and tea as part of it, um, count it as half of their volume so that you, you make up for a little bit of that diuretic effect that they can have. But technically, they do count because they are mostly water. That's what I thought. Okay, thank you. You bet. Um, I actually have a question for you. So I know um, that because um, you're a fan of the Garmin, right? And I'm a fan of the uh -huh. Garmin as well. Um, I actually just use it as my watch because I don't want to wear an Apple watch and a Garmin. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> for everyone else out there, I have a specific reason for wanting a Garmin. Um, but for everyone else out there, what other types of devices would you suggest for them? Or what which ones are would you rank, I suppose, if you're trying to track the things you mentioned earlier, which ones would you maybe rank higher? Um, so the first thing with it when it comes to the devices is that it should be something that is easy for you to wear based on your lifestyle all the time. And so the um for me um i think that um this this ring this aura ring that i have um i think they're o-u-r-a um they that's the easiest thing to wear uh, because it you know it sits on my finger it looks like my regular my regular wedding band and it's going to measure my body temperature it's going to measure my sleep it's going to measure all these different things um and you know keep track of it nice and neatly um, and if I decide, well, I want a different style watch today, then, you know, I'm not changing it. Um, the other things that are really, really good are some of the simply wrist-based things, like a Fitbit um, is a really good way of just measuring your activity and what's going on. Um, and then the Apple Watch is a great, you know, a great device. Um, the, the, you know, ECG features are really, really close to equivalent to um like a you know hospital grade thing i mean i you know i talked about in the beginning i work on the weekends on the the ski patrol i've put it on a patient before and and found an early sign of a heart attack um from somebody oh, wow. so from that sort of health thing they can be super super helpful um and then um if you start to step up into the garments um and you get into some of these really sports specific ones i mean some of the newer garmin watches um and once you start to get into Garmin, sort of the brand is not important, whether it's Garmin, Sunto, Polar, Coro, there's tons of different brands that make these activity watches. Um, but the Garmin's, I mean, there's a pulse oximeter on the back of the Garmin. And I've had patients before that were looking at their Garmin data and they're showing me their running information. And then I look at it and I've had two people so far that we caught sleep apnea who they didn't know they had sleep apnea. Um, we sent them for sleep studies and they went to the doctor and so 
that can be a really powerful tool. Um, and obviously the cost seems to go up the more powerful the tool gets. Um, but that those 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 features on the Garmin watches that measure that pulse oximeter and stuff like that are really, really important. And I, I've, I, the other question, I have, so in terms of like, I know my Garmin has in terms of like how like the quality of it and how long it lasts, I, I'm very pleased with it. But these other, yep. like the Apple Watch, you, you would think, you would say is about the same or? Uh, yeah, I mean, Apple Watches, you know, they're going to last you a while. Um, the cool part about them is that you're going to get updates with uh, like software that mm -hmm. add to some of the, the features to it um and and that's pretty pretty nice but um yeah most of these devices now you know i would say they're basically being designed to last you around two years garmin's a little bit better i would say they're designed to last you about four years um and a lot of that is just based off of like the product refresh cycles um mm -hmm. and when they sort of expect people to to change them up um but i would say as far as like a, a garmin's one of the top as far as like the longevity and lasting i mean i saw someone the other day with a garmin thing that it, man, it had to be from like 2004. Um, and they, you know, their stuff, they do last a long time. Excellent, thank you. Justin, this is David Mandy again. So um, having left New York after 30 years I, of professional work, I haven't been able to go back to a gym now that I'm up here. So I just get on my bicycle. I'm there. So I do intervals, but it's very interesting what I found is I trying to rehabilitate my knees. Um, I do these intervals where I go up a steep hill and then I come down, walk the bike down. I had no idea how good that is. I guess, is it called eccentric? Could you explain yeah. what I'm doing there? Because I was just kind of stumbled onto it and then started to find my flexibility just changed dramatically. Yeah, so your muscles all have two different types of strength. They're gonna have a concentric strength, which is what everybody really thinks about as strength. And that's when the muscle shortens and so that's when if you think about doing a bicep curl when you're like bringing the weight up to you but then if we start to think about that eccentric strength it's your ability to slowly lower the weight from that top end of the curl all the way down and what you're doing is you're training the muscle to slowly resist force and what happens is a lot of people think that flexibility is based off of the length of the muscle. And if we were to take somebody and bring them into an OR and knock them out, um, we can bend them in all different ways. You as a human, people are incredibly flexible. Um, what happens though, is that your body will inherently limit your range of motion based on the strength that you have available to control that range of motion. By going down the hill and walking slowly down the hill, you're challenging the ability to slowly control the movement, which builds more strength, which makes your body give you access to a greater range of motion because it has confidence that you'll control that range of motion. And being able to control that range of motion is key as far as allowing you to move through more of it. Got it, got it. We have Kent Williams on the line. Kent, do you have a question today? Love to hear it. Okay. Scott, do we have other questions? Yeah, I have one uh, that just came in and it is, uh, can you speak a little bit about the importance of stretching uh, in addition to the physical exercise you describe or just as a standalone? So um, stretching is one of these things that I think gets um, sort of overused for different things. So um, kind of like we just we just talked about with the eccentrics, um, strengthening is way more important. If I wanted to, and I don't remember the exact numbers, but it's, if I wanted to lengthen a muscle, like let's say I wanted to take your muscle and make it longer and make it stay longer forever, I think it's about 2,000 pounds of force is about the amount that it needs. And you have to hold it under tension with around 2,000 pounds of force for around two minutes in order to actually change the length of the muscle. So when you stretch, what you're really doing is you're fatiguing out some of your stretch reflex receptors that will then allow you a little bit more motion, but only for a very short period of time. And so I tell people, if you feel good when you stretch, it's fine. Stretch, go for it. Um, 
but don't spend a ton of time doing it because the money or the big difference, the big change is going to be in the strength training. Uh, and that's where you can really make a difference because if you make that muscle stronger, then it's going to allow it to get longer and it's going to allow the resting tension of the muscle to relax. Hamstrings are like a prime example. Um, the amount of people who say, like, oh, I got really tight hamstrings. I stretch them every day, really tight hamstrings, stretch them every day. We teach them to strengthen their hamstrings. And in like three weeks, they've got all this flexibility they didn't know they had. Um, and so strengthening is a much more powerful tool. Wow, I did not know that. Thank you. That's the uh, questions that we've had uh, sent in. Again, if anyone in the audience would like to ask a question, chat it in or raise your hand. Uh, it's a good opportunity to ask Justin a question. So Justin, as a runner, um, would you think that stretching is a little more important if you're just if you're running, skiing versus? For runners, we actually try and get them to avoid stretching. Um, okay. I always sort of joke around like if you go to the the um, so running right? The common overuse injuries we see with running are a lot of tendon stress injuries. Mm -hmm. And if you stretch, you're putting a lot of stress on the tendon. So by running, you're already putting so much stress on the tendon. We actually will try and get people to decrease that stress on the tendon by same idea, by strengthening it, making it more accepting of the load. Um, I sort of, you know, joke around, like if you look at the elite runners in a marathon, uh, most of them can't touch their toes. And if you watch like the, um, and there's unfortunately not a lot of marathons on right now, but if you watch as these elite runners go by, you could almost see the tension in their muscles as their hamstrings and, and everything as they run by. And they're really, really tight because running is a very mid-range activity. And so as long as you're staying in that mid-range, you don't really need that end range. And when you get to that elite level, they don't really want to waste any effort on a range they're not using. Um, so a lot of our runners, we'll try and get them away from stretching so much and into a lot more strength training. Got it. Interesting. I have um, two people in the audience who've raised their hand, so I'm going to call on uh, Terry Denton. Terry, if uh, you can ask your question now. Terry, are you able to um, hear us? Go ahead and ask your question. I'm going to check in with Art Yevin. Art, are you able to hear us? Hi. Um, Hi, how are What you? do you think of Silver? Okay, fine, thank you. What do you think of Silver Sneaker classes? Uh, the Silver Sneaker program is great. Um, the uh, the different, different classes, there's actually a lot of research that goes into the different movements and the different classes. Um, the gym that our office is in offers them. Um, and... Uh, everything that I've seen about them, they're really, really good. And most of the gyms, um, if you're going to just the Silver Sneakers class, they'll also give you access to the rest of the facility um, to to use any of the other stuff. So I think they're a great thing. Thank you. Thank you, Art. Just another question, David Mandy. So I'm a runner, always been, I've been a runner for what, 30 years now? I, I, uh, I just get slower. You know, it doesn't really become running anymore. But in fact, I'll even use trekking poles. But people mm -hmm. say you have to give up running. Doctors is the first thing they say, knee doctor, stop running. But I find the activity of a fast walk it just incredible. It does, it's, it's as good as, I feel as good at the end as I did when I ran full speed. I mean, it's yeah. a real, I think it's a great, I, I just find it to be an excellent exercise still. There's a lot of research on the, um, so running actually will decrease your risk of like knee arthritis and different knee issues over time. Um, it, the compressive load on the knee joint will help produce more lubricating fluid and all these things. So it is definitely not something that you should give up. Um, the main reason why you, you know people feel they get slower over time is that over time your muscles lose the explosive capacity. Um, if it's something you don't the twitch, you, as they say, exactly, yeah. yeah. Right. Um, and so it just tends to be something that you don't use as much as you age, and so you'll lose it a little bit. Um, it can be gained back, right, by like different jumping and bounding things, um, but it doesn't need to be. You can get the same benefit from the fast walk and doing all that stuff, but it is definitely not something 
to uh, to give up. It's it's got a lot of really back? good benefits. Justin, lower back. Even better for your. Yeah, it's even better for your lower back. Um, the <laughs> the research on your discs and everything show that the constant compression and then expansion and the compression and expansion actually helps build up the fluid and and make more of that joint fluid, the synovial fluid flow through the joints and it's it's much better for you. Um, and over time, you'll see a decrease in back injuries um, from people who run. I hate to see people my age though running uh, heavier, running on uh, pavement. Yeah, I mean, great. if you can use a softer, if you can use a for softer me it matters. surface. Yeah. yeah, if you use a softer surface, it's generally a little bit better. Um, what I usually tell people is the best thing for you is to vary the surface. Use some pavement. That's fine if you're going to do that once a week. Use some grass or some track. You know, track is a good thing. Um, treadmills are great. Um, get, you know, get on a, um, you know, maybe like a soccer field or, you know, some sort of field that you can go across. There's all different things that you can use. But, yeah, the more you vary it up, the better. Well, that's how put why I'm, your counsel is so important because we all have a tendency to find a routine that we like and we just lock into it, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah, exactly. That's the hardest part is getting people to break their routine. And to do, very, right, as you say, to switch it up. That's, uh, I guess, Virgo. Certain personalities probably do it better than others. Certain signs. Mm -hmm. Oh, definitely. <laughs> Jennifer? Yep. Other thoughts? Jennifer, Franklin? Uh, it does look like Kent, are you on? Did you want to ask a question? Um, maybe I. Kent's, Kent's just listening in, which is fine. He is okay. That's fine. I it looked he looked like he was unmuted. Um, no, I I mean for me that's fine. Uh, Scott, do we have any other questions from the listen-in only audience? No, not at the moment. But we're still here to take one if uh, anybody would like to ask. So, Justin, this is the kind of thing where a lot of people have misconceptions, don't they? Everybody kind of gets bits and pieces of information, right? Yep, correct. And the more, uh, you know, with the growth of the Internet and all these things, um, it's a great way to spread misinformation. So it's, yeah. Well, so if we if we don't have any other uh, further questions, we'll certainly um, take one if we get one. But I I just want to point out how um, we we thank you very much for doing this with us, Justin. And and I love how um, out of the box I meet your approaches. It just it it makes so much sense, right? And and today I think people are looking for options that that make more a bit more sense, right? And so um, you know I think I don't we don't see anyone else that wants to ask anything, correct, Scott? That's correct. Well, this has been so, so valuable because we'll be able to send it out in replay to people that really need to see it. Yes. And I think that let, I'm hoping this is the beginning of uh, an alliance that continues and we continue to popularize what you're doing, Justin, because it's important. Definitely. Thank you so much. I really appreciate the opportunity. I really appreciate your time. Yeah, so I think what we'll do now is we'll turn it over to you, Justin, for some closing remarks and um, certainly let people uh, know how they can get in touch with you, uh, maybe get some more. We will put some more information about your services when uh, redistributing the um, replay to everyone. So if you want to get in contact with Justin, but um, I'll just let uh, Justin close from here. Yeah, so I just want to thank everybody for you know tuning in for the time and the opportunity to um, spread all this information. As far as you know, I'm concerned. Any chance I have that I could could help people, you know, learn about this stuff and what to do, um, it you know, it's a golden opportunity. I really, really appreciate being able to talk to everybody. Um, I am always more than happy to be a resource for anybody, um, whether it's to help you with all this stuff or help you find somebody in your area or region or that might fit you a little bit better to you know to to get started on a plan like this. Um, my email is just my first name, Justin, at FeldmanPhysicalTherapy.com. I'm more than happy to field any questions over email or anything like that. Um, and then uh, our website is FeldmanPhysicalTherapy.com. And so you can head on over there. There's a ton of information, all sorts of different blogs and content. Um, and we're happy to you know, field anything from anybody that we want. Um, and any way that we can be of resource, don't hesitate to reach out. Um, we're constantly, you know, helping people all around the country find providers that that can help them in their local area. So uh, the more, you know, the more that we can help people get in contact with the right people, the better off everybody will be.
Now, Justin, and, given the way the world's changing and people are getting, you know, coming online, it seems to, I mean, my wife is on a, um, a exercise online. Would de When you say in their own areas, I mean, is there a part of you that has a virtual kind of thing that you do that you can do with anyone, anywhere? Or is it pretty yes. much depend upon them coming in to see you physically? Oh, no, we could do, we could do virtual visits with anybody anywhere. Um, we could, you know, anywhere in the world really now, which is pretty amazing. Um, yeah. And I think, you know, if there's one good thing that comes out of our current situation is that people are a little bit more aware of it. Um, we've been sort of doing the virtual thing for around three or four years now. And, uh, you know, now, it, now it's great to see it gaining, you know, gaining in popularity and, and, and moving through. So yeah, we could definitely get people all over. Um, the only time where we need, you need to find somebody in your area is if it's a true injury that needs physical therapy, um, then you got to have someone licensed in your area. And so well, I'm only licensed in some states, not all of them yet, but I'm working on the rest. Sounds great. I thank everyone for your attendance today. Wish you a pleasant afternoon. And thank you again to Justin, Justin Feldman. Thank you so much. All thank you, Justin. Thank you.